for me either, but I'm like, that's great. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to learn something new too. It so, is, and it wasn't hard. Yeah, you did a great job. Be, okay, go for Everyone it. ready for prayer? Yes. Yes, okay. Heavenly Father, we just come to you, Lord, with such thanks in our heart for the wondrous works and all the things you do for each of us. Thank you, Lord, for this such a special weekend. Good Friday, I always think of you on the cross as this hymn that we sang talks about. I always think of, of what you did for us, Lord, in the full salvation that each of us is striving to receive, Lord, through your merits, your merits alone. And thank you also, it's an Easter weekend, Lord, when you, the resurrection and the restoration that you promise uh, in spring, it, it, it always shows such beautiful life with the birds singing and, and the flowers blooming, Lord, and it's promise. It's, it's representative of the promise to each of us that you've given that you're going to restore it. Thank you for the lessons, Lord, these beautiful presentations in this camp meeting. The hymns that were sung were so beautiful, Lord, and heartfelt. And that we can all come together like we do like this, Lord, that you provide this opportunity for us and that you're with each of us, so close to each of us in our own respective homes, yet your presence is felt with us as a group. Thank you, Lord. And we just praise you with our whole heart and soul for all the times that you've showered us, Lord, with your mercy and that you've forgiven us, Lord, of our sins and that you heal us, our tiredness, um, our body aches and, and um, the different things that are going on with each of us, with our health. And you just help us, Lord, even through our times of despair. And you give us enthusiasm again for life. Just You're just so wonderful. Can't say enough, Lord. We're just so grateful that you care for us like you do. You're the King of Kings. We love you, Lord. And we praise you. And we just strive to be a blessing to you and your people, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity today. And... Um, we just pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Beautiful prayer. Yeah. So these are the individuals who are going to present today. And um, I'm very excited about it. And I'm going to stop screen share, but right here, I'm just going to keep um, notes on on what, what we learned so uh, we can have a reference to later if we need. Um, we don't have to go in this exact order. If someone wants to go first, um, I'll leave it up to you all. Unless this, because I don't think Tony's here yet. Is she? I'm ready to go, uh, but I'll, I will um, let someone else if they would prefer to go first. I vote Susan. Pardon me? I vote Susan go first. <laughs> I'm very rusty, guys. I haven't done this for a couple of years, so I might even need a little help um, sharing the screen. I have a PowerPoint, some slides um, to try and make it more interesting. <laughs> yeah. So do I just go to share screen? Yep. And you have the file open, right? The PowerPoint open. So that's where I might need help. Keynote with so it's keynote. So hit that. But it says keynote unknown. So what do I do? Well, you have to have the actual slideshow open. It is open. Okay. So when you click share screen, it should show up in the window as one of your choices to click on. Okay. I'm trying again. So share screen. Does somebody know if the Mac works but, different when you share a screen? Yeah, see, I'm on a Mac. It says desktop one, but that I'm on. There's a whiteboard. 
uh, keynote, but it just says unknown on keynote, open system preferences. Um, well, the keynote is your, your presentation, right? I think so. Yes. So try yeah. that. If, it, if that doesn't work, then we'll try the desktop. Try the keynote first. Uh -huh. I, I did, and I, it's opened me up to a security privacy box um, that shows uh, files and folders, but it wouldn't be file and folder, right? You could search for it in there, can't you? Like a browse? Like browse On the file and folder, it's just got WhatsApp and Google Chrome. Okay. Uh, then if that doesn't work, try the desktop, but note that we'll be able to see whatever's whatever you have open and your back screen and everything else. Yeah, I've got it completely open. So I'm surprised, um, shoot. I was a little worried about this part of it. Share, what if I just hit share? Yeah. Then it says open system preferences, uh, Zoom. Maybe that, maybe I try Zoom. Um, Zoom us will not be able to record the contents of your screen until it is quit. Quit now. You can choose to quit Zoom us now or do it on your own later. I don't want to quit, right? Right. So, um, so I Googled this real quick. If you go back to your keynote and then uh, click on it and go down to preferences, what does it... Go down, uh, keynotes open. Yeah. Should I make it, should I open it large in the play version? No, no, no. Just go to keynote and then go to preferences. If there's a tab on top of your Apple screen thing. Yeah, where it goes keynote, go. And Got then it. Uh, check the allow app switching while presenting. Uh, I don't see allow apps. Have, have you the already hit um, in Zoom? Have you already hit share screen? General, yes. Okay. Already hit share screen. Usually, it, I thought usually it comes up and lets us know someone's going to share a screen, but then the file shows up after. No, on the Google thing, it says um, you might need to go into keynote preferences and then <coughs> make sure that it allows app switching while presenting for um, to allow oh, full access. Yeah, I, I see slideshow. Um, yeah, select the slideshow tab. And so let's open display preferences. Preferences and then slideshow tab and then allow app switching. Color night shift. I'm trying. Airplay display. Uh, no. Are you in the slideshow so, tab? I, oh, I, let's see here. Slideshow. Yes, I'm on the slideshow tab. It shows displaying scale slideshow to fit display, enable presenter display in full screen. That's that's checked. Okay, what about allow app switching? Is there a thing that says that? Yeah, oh, there it is. I just see it, yay. Now what? Is it checked or marked or whatever? Yeah, I just checked it, I just checked it. Perfect, okay, now let's try sharing again. Okay, thank you. Share screen. Yeah, there it is. Yippee. <laughs> You're a master helper. Now I hit share. Oh, Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yay. Can you see all the side ones too, or just the yeah. main one? The whole thing. You can see it all, yeah. Okay, well, that won't matter, right? Let's see. Now, once you hit, so play. I hit play. There we go. So this is Japan. And I chose Japan because my brother was stationed there um, in the Navy and he loved Japan. And then my cousin later went to Japan. Um, he traveled the world several times and he ended up staying in Japan and married a Japanese gal named Kyoko. And these are their two twin daughters. So I used them for the cover page. It's, that's Jasmine and Lilac. My cousins, um, my cousin Mark is a professor in Japan. So I thought it would be interesting to see what Japan, you know, what's going on with sexism, sexism and equality in the culture. So centuries ago, women ruled Japan. What changed? Does anybody know what changed? I say traditions. 
Okay, well, whatever, we'll just keep going and see if that fits with what we um, discover. So this is this picture here is um, a woodblock print of an empress, not the first empress, but one of many. And she's depicted kind of as a warrior in a lot of the pictures because women were warriors. And, um, but the thing that's interesting about this is they call her uh, quasi mythical or quasi historical and quasi means supposedly or seemingly kind of like they um, relegate the women as inferior even as they're documenting their history as if like it's it didn't really happen mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah so it plants like a uh, a different mentality in people as time progresses so um in 1889 empresses had ruled up to that point um, over several centuries, and then they were finally barred from ruling in 1889. And I noted a couple of facts on that. I did that after I put the whole presentation together. Um, there was an excellent book, but they wanted $100 for it for Kindle. But it was discussing um, post um, Fukushima and disasters and, and its effects on the gender um, and culture. And so I went back and in 1888, just before this 1889 barring of the empresses being uh, rulers in Japan, there was this big eruption, a big volcanic um, eruption of Mount Bandai. And that was during the Meiji um, Reformation period, which was like a breakdown of the feudalistic period in Japan. And um, so it's a failure in a way. <laughs> I'm just noting this. I don't know if I'm correct, but I thought it was interesting. The women failed um, during that period of continuing on, um, you know, uh, with women's rights. And then again, in 1923, there was a big earthquake and um, it enlivened a women's temperance movement in there in Japan and um, Christian movements with women. But again, it sort of died out like, and um, the men prevailed again. So I saw that again as failure. And then just recently we had the Fukushima nuclear disaster, right? It, but the women have gained traction this time around. And as we go through the slides, I think it's really interesting because um, we're in the line of success and it appears that um, the Japanese women are having greater success now than they were previously. So we'll do just a little bit of history on the female rulers. So. The um, archeologists have discovered in the tombs that there were female chie chieftains. They were prevalent in Western Japan during the fourth century. Um, these women were buried alongside iron weapons and tools um, like that picture had depicted of the Empress. They were warriors, right? They were competent political, military and religious leaders. Um, and the tombs of the male chieftains only began appearing in the fifth century. So females were a very big part of the ruling class in Japan. And so while the tradition of female rulers and chieftains was commonplace in ancient Japan, history books still tend to emphasize the feats of the male emperors. Just like I um, was explaining how they list that empress as a quasi mythical historical figure, right? Making it sound like ah, she didn't really even exist. And so even if the female empress achieved many things, they're still not regarded as prominently as the male emperors were. And um, Japan's first recorded empress was Su Suiko and she ruled from 592 for around 35 years until her death. And she was credited with um, forming the country's first constitution 
and uh, they had a powerful Empress Koken who ruled twice, and um, then another Empress uh, Shotuku, and she worked to spread Buddhism beyond the capital. And it goes on to mention another Empress um, Genemi, who even put her daughter on the throne when she was abdicating which we'll see now in modern day Japan, they still have a ruling class, which is very interesting. Um, they still have a monarchy and it's male dominated. And I'll show you what they do with the women now. But back then um, the Empress could even put her own daughter on the throne. It wasn't um, male lineage um, dominated. And so some historians maintain the empresses were merely puppet rulers. Again, see, they don't want to give them the credit. Um, who abdicated once a suitable mare, male heir came of age. So again, even the verbiage they use is that women aren't suitable, only the men are. And um, others say they shaped Japan's history more than their male counterparts. So there is documentation um, of the good things that the women did. But from today's perspective, it's interesting to think of how the contribution of Japan's past reigning empresses to history has become so diminished. By totally ignoring these women or interpreting their roles as mere fillers, right, until a, a suitable man comes along, um, Japanese society offers no historical imagination for what women can be. And do. So this was Empress Suiko, another um, illustration of her. And she was the first reigning empress that's been recorded in Japan. And she was credited with allowing Buddhism um, to come into Japan. And we'll explore that just a little bit. I know we can't go real deep, but I've got kind of a broad brush um, presentation just to kind of give you a feel and an understanding of how um, things have come about to where they are today. But so she allowed Buddhism into Japan, which began to increase the Chinese influence in Japan. So who rules Japan today? Well, it's em the emperor of Japan and his name is Naruhito. And he uh, ascended to the throne on May 1st. That's my birthday. So that stuck out to me. <laughs> Might not mean anything to you guys, but um, in 2019. So this is him here and his wife. And they call him, he likes to go by his imperial majesty or his majesty. And he acceded, they call it the chrysanthemum throne. And that is the... Um, symbol or the stand right there it's a chrysanthemum um, and that's the standard for the emperor and so here's the genealogy and keep in mind the reason I'm showing you the um, royalty is because they are the role models right and of society and you'll see that they actually carry very much influence um, over what happens um, politically in Japan. And so I can't, don't think I can use my cursor, but to the left of your screen um, at the top uh, shows the former emperor and his wife. And then it shows um, below them is the new emperor Naruhito and the empress, but they only have a daughter. So that daughter won't be able to um, fill the role. And so you go next to the next son of that emperor, Akihito, and it's crown prince Akashino. And it's interesting that the princess he married because in the royal family, the princesses, if they choose to marry outside of royalty, they must completely um, lose their title. Uh, they get like uh, money you know, like $350,000 or whatever, like a, a settlement and that's to last them, that's it. And they have no claims to the throne. And so this princess that married the crown prince there, 
who is, um, they, they've got the son at the bottom there, Prince. They've got the two daughters, Mako and Keiko, and that Prince Hashito. That Prince Hashito is the next in line because he's the only male heir. But the crown princess, she, had, she was very educated. Um, she had a very good job. Uh, and she had to give all that up to uh, conform to um, the rules of the royal family or lose everything. And so she chose to give everything up and be submissive and, um, you know, not, not a very good role model for the women in Japan. Wonder what it would have happened if they would have had all girls. So they were concerned about that. It was a big concern what they were going to do. Um, if I back up and you look over to the right, mm -hmm. you see um, it's all women, right? right? That's what so I was saying. Had, that's it. And so this one little guy here at the bottom um, is their only hope, basically, if nothing oh. changes. No right? pressure. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. So the Japanese monarchy is said to be the oldest continuous hereditary monarchy in the world. The Imperial House recognizes 126 monarchs beginning with the, a legendary emperor, Jimu. And I'll show you something that's really interesting about him too, the founder Jimu. Um, and it, this line supposedly continues right up to the current um, Emperor Naruhito. So here's a picture of Jimu. Now, if you remember the picture of um, the Empress that I showed you at the beginning, they said she was quasi-mythical, quasi-historical. But here, they have it as legendary, right? <laughs> and also, I found it very interesting interesting that he kind of resembles Nimrod. He, it, they have him, you know, as a mighty hunter. And uh, he, it, this line of emperors um, are Shinto, uh, Shinto religion. And we'll look at that. And that is uh, a nature um, religion that has a sun goddess very much like Babylon, if you go back to um, Nimrod and, and how that all came about and his relationship with his mother. It's just very interesting. So is Japan a monarchy or a democracy? Anyone know? I say like democracy. It's a constitutional monarchy mm. with with a parliamentary government so um they're they've kind of very much modeled it in a way um similar to england but they like to emulate the west as well and um they do have a constitution which um we'll go into that a little more but the emperor still is at the center of this um, constitutional monarchy. So in 1869, um, the royal family as being the only uh, ruling um, force in Japan just became kind of a symbol with the constitution, very much like the royal family of England um, and, and their parliament, right? And uh, prime minister, uh, they still kind of work hand in hand, but the royal family is more of a symbol. It, it doesn't have the same power that it, that it did before. And so mo modern Japan is built around this modern constitutional monarchy but they very much value their traditions. Like you mentioned, Francisco, they're very traditionalist. And, um, you know, they have, take pride in that. And that imperial line goes back for centuries, right? And so the emperor is still the center of this modern polity. And this began in 1868. 
And so the long-term survival of the world's oldest monarchy will depend on this schoolboy. Um, when Japan's current em emperor abdicates next week. So this was written in 2019, just before um, Emperor um, Naruhito um, took position for his father. And so he's getting old. I believe he's like uh, 53 or something like that. So this little guy is their only hope. And um, Akashin will be first in line. That's his father, but he's already 53. So the whole future of the imperial family depends on this one little boy, that he will remain healthy and be willing to marry and have children with his wife, right? In conservative and patriarchal Japan excludes women who actually make up 13 of the 18 members of the royal family, but they're excluded from taking the throne, even though it looks as though they began Japan on the throne and this, so this wasn't always the case. And um, this particular article cited that Chinese history in 57 after the death of Christ, um, Japan was called a queen country because of its female rulers. Question? So, yes. Um, in 1888, I think you said is where it stopped having female rulers. Did it say why besides that volcano thing? Okay, so I'll go back real quick to the 1888. So it was 1889 that okay. they, and that was during the Meiji, M E I J I, pronounced Meiji um, restoration period, where it was like an industrial time um, where they were going through modernization. And um, I've got some slides on that. But I, 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 thought that was interesting too, um, Adriana, because I said 1889, what happened just before that? And that's what made me look, if you'll see at the bottom of the screen, they had the eruption um, in 1888 during that, um, during that reform period. And like I said, there's a really excellent book called Gender, Culture and Disaster. It's a um, academic book but even on Kindle, it's over a hundred dollars. And it's about um, what happens, um, even gender changes that happen after big disasters in Japan. So we'll go forward to where we were. So, you know, probably could take a lot more um, study. <clears throat> so Thank you. the modern, uh-huh. The modernization of Japan. So. This is a, just a picture of the Meiji era when they began to um, adopt a constitution. So as Japan modernized during this Meiji era of 1868 to 1912, the leaders of the time changed the role of the emperor. They reinstated him as a military commander in chief because a woman could no longer command the military. Meiji leaders believed it would make no sense to have reigning female empresses. So a male only succession was established and the desire to emulate the West was also very strong. So Meiji leaders took this inspiration from the Prussian constitution, which also forbade women from ascending the throne. And there you go again in 1889 that, so that maybe adds a little more meat to your question, Adriana. Um, the women were barred from being enthroned. That was perfect, and, thank you. Uh-huh. And uh, Japan didn't wish to really replicate, replicate completely, right, the British model where Queen Victoria reigned. But they did take on um, the same way that, that uh, England is, where you have a royal family with a parliament, right? So that's what they did, except Japan barred women. So instead, what we saw was this period of masculinization of the emperor and of Japanese society in general. So as the Meiji regime emphasized the perceived superiority of men over women. And um, in the Meiji constitution, the notion of house was inscribed. And this notion of house is uh, where you're getting the subjugation of the roles, 
right, that are to be played, the gender roles. Um, you had the subordinated wives and household members and, and their roles under the patriarch leader, right, the headship. And this hadn't been the case before. And it's explained that during the Meiji era, modern Japan formally became, that's when they formally became a patriarchal society. Some Meiji laws on birth rights and marriages, such as married couples using the same surname, you know, went to using the man's name are still applicable today. So the US influence was very strong, especially after um, World War II. Um, and these, and that brought a lot of changes to the society. Um, Japan wanted to embrace these American values, right? And, and the American culture slowly got introduced um, into the Japanese culture. And so under the post-war constitution, the emperor's position was changed again from ruler to figurehead and the imperial family was banned from engaging in politics. But while women were given the right to vote in 1945, there's that 45, which is big for us, um, no efforts were made to reinstate their right to the throne. The US didn't want to alienate the Japanese establishment by diminishing the emperor's status. People thought the question of gender in the imperial family should be dealt with by future government. So they push it off, right? That's... <laughs> Don't fix it. Such discussions finally came to a head in 2004 under their prime minister, um, Junichiro Koizumi, whose cabinet formed a panel of politicians and academics to consider the issue. At the time, the imperial family had not produced a male heir. That was your question there too, um, Francisco. What happens if they don't have a male heir? And up to that point, they hadn't up to this little boy that, you know, is our only hope. Um, while Crown Prince Naruhito and Crown Princess, uh, the current um, emperor and empress, that's them, but they're younger. They only have a daughter. So under current law, only male heirs with emperors on their father's side. So even only with emperors on their father's side can su succeed to the throne. Um, the panel's report suggested a legal change either to allow a female mo monarch or to reinstate members of the old aristocracy who were stripped of their royal status after World War II. But the proposition provoked such strong opposition from the ultra conservatives. Um, and the plans were shelved once Hisahito was born to Princess Kiko, the wife of Crown Prince Akashino in 2006. So once that boy was born, um, all talk was off the table for women. So they call it the unreformed chrysanthemum throne. And that's the throne and it's um, kept in uh, Kyoto Imperial Palace where they do all the emperor ceremonies. And that's Emperor Naruhutu um, in his traditional um, clothing. And amid changing global attitudes on gender equality, nearly two thirds of Japanese, so they're favoring it, right? A larger portion are beginning to favor a revision in these laws to allow women to ascend to the throne. And that was according to a poll in 2017. And so the debate on whether to let women who marry commoners um, but is still also remaining in the imperial family. Um, that's resurfaced, that debate, because uh, people don't think it's fair. Why should a woman have to give up her education, her job, you know, uh, just to submit to um, these rules, these archaic rules? And so that's just another picture of the um, uh, immediate royal family. 
So female le leadership remains elusive overall in Japan, despite moves by the government to empower working women under a scheme dubbed womenomics. Just 10% of politicians in Japan's House of Representatives are female. And um, so Japan has one of the worst uh, gender imbalances in legislatures worldwide. And there's an unconscious gender bias. And there's this male entitlement that's very pervasive in Japan. And despite the legal, the legacy of powerful female rulers, right, and the legacy, they undermine the legacy by delegating them to quasi as supposed rulers, right? So despite this legacy of the female rulers, the prospect of modern day equivalent is remote without significant moves to redress gender equality. Some women think having a female emperor might be a good, might be good as a kind of a role model, but getting a female monarch is wishful thinking at this time. And this was written in 2019. So the only likely change to the monarchy in the near future is one allowing princesses to stay in the imperial family, even if they marry a commoner. Um, that could potentially um, pave the way for female succession in the future. And there was one princess, um, she made the news. Uh, she chose to marry for love. And I think they gave her uh, a settlement. Um, uh, but it was, it was quite brave, I thought, of her. She chose to give up all her um, rights to the throne. And she married a commoner um, for reasons of the heart, you know, for other reasons. So, so they don't, the imperial people, they don't even do anything political, right? So they're just, they're kind of like a show family. Kind of like a show family, although uh, I think they have more clout than, than what it says, because it seems that the emperor has the ear of the, of the people. Do you know what I mean? The people in the yeah. politics. Yeah, I know. Yep. Got it. So um, I learned a new word, androcentrism. And I thought that um, image was a good depiction of, of the word. It's women um, bowing in submission to men. And so the actual definition of androcentrism, it's the practice, conscious or otherwise, of placing a masculine point of view at the center of one's worldview, culture, and history, thereby culturally marginalizing femininity. So that's what they've done too throughout the years to kind of wipe away that the history of women in Japan and to um, create this new, um, point of view, this new mindset, uh, a masculine preferred point of view, masculine, male dominated um, for power and control. The Pardon note, me? It's interesting the note place saying that it's uh, placing a masculine point of view at the center of one's worldview, because that's what we're learning so much. What, what is our worldview, you know? Yes, that's why this really jumped out at me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it kind of made me think after Adriana's question, um, because the emperor is the center. They made him the center in this parliament. And in a way, I just thought of it when I was reading this. Is he the center of one's worldview? You know, because he's, he's the epitome of this patriarchal um, mentality, you know? This is their masculine point of view. Yeah. So while many countries around the world have patriarchal societies, Japan is often cited as a primary example. Japan's conservative patriarchal culture is highly influenced by the Buddhist and Confucian values on which the country was built. These values have been present throughout Japan's long history and have contributed to a traditional mindset regarding the proper roles 
proper of men and women. This mindset became especially prominent during Japan's rapid modernization, which I kind of broad brushed, which was known as the Meiji era. And this resulted in a state system that promoted a gendered division of labor as a key factor for the country's success. Uh, the system enforced the notion of women as housewives and men as the breadwinners. The resulting androcentrism has created a myriad of difficulties for working women, such as limited self-determination due to cultural pressures and a lack of significant opportunities for participation in business and politics. So they, how do they establish a patriarchal a patriarchy? Patriarchal societies are most often a result of cultural and religious factors. Japan in particular has been greatly influenced by Shinto, Buddhism, and Confucianism. In the majority of societies, cultural values and attitudes can be traced back to their teachings. So religion plays a huge role as we, as we know from our message. So the first religion um, that was birthed in Japan is Shinto and that's a Shinto shrine. And Shinto is the native Japanese um, religion, which they believe is completely um, Japanese, right? It's not found anywhere else. And it's a nature religion with a female goddess. Shinto is the Japanese indigenous religion and it's shrouded in mystery. Its true age and founder are unknown and it lacks any sacred scriptures. The first records of Shinto practices appear in the oldest chronicles of Japanese history, the Kojuki and Nihon Shoki, both dating back to the beginning of the eighth century. These chronicles also represent the first documented attitudes towards women in the country, and they indicate that ancient Japan was a matrilineal society. So, there again, shows women were at the lead until this uh, religious thinking began to be pervasive. You know what's interesting? Not just Japan, but a lot of other countries that have religions that have female goddesses or, you know, what something in the mythology, they manage to close their eyes to that and still have a patriarchal society. And I don't know how yeah, that- I how thought about that too. I'm so glad you brought that up because it popped in my head a couple of times, but I, I didn't make anything of it. But now that you're bringing it up, yes, how can they uh, worship a female, huh? Yet not see the value of a female. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's a- it's, uh this this conservatism clogs your mind and it's a it's just so twisted and weird because i've i've seen that a lot in uh i'm pretty sure all the pagan religions have a female goddess in there somewhere and from what i've ever seen in history is that they still manage to have a patriarchal society every single time so i don't know fascinating catholicism Catholics with Mary, Mary. That's right, with Mary. That is, wow. That's yes. such a good point. They venerate, they, venerate, they, venerate, they venerate Mary, but then all the popes and all the cardinals and, you know, they're all men. Well, look at, look at Protestantism today because when, what we're learning about um, uh, the, the women, the, the, they can have, I mean, because I sit there and I think about Amy um, Barrett, I can't think of the middle name um, she has. Oh, Amy Coney Barrett. Coney Barrett, yeah. Um, you know, because they can have these high profile, high powerful jobs, but they're submissive still. Yes. Um, let me just point out SDA with Ellen White. Yeah. Yes. The lesser light. 
Christine, I didn't even think of that. Because <laughs> now that she's passed away, I mean, we can venerate her all we want, right? And she's no threat. Oh, wow. It's Isn't easy. that so true, but so sad? Easier to believe a lie. Yeah. Yeah, we go. Need to be thinkers. But not those free thinkers. Yep. That's one of the biggest blessings of what we're learning, um, how God is opening our minds, right? And maybe some of us had felt um, some of these things or knew some of these things to be true, but we sort of fall into line with what everyone else is telling us. You know what I mean? Like when you're in the structure and um, I would question something, but then I'm like, well, they know more than me, you know, they've been in the religion longer than me but you know just the fact that we we think or question something we need to like you said elaine don't just be persuaded by the answers that some people give us look think dig deeper yeah I was you know, God this was morning um during one of the presentations i don't remember which one but how i without knowing it, it was before i became a christian I purposely raised my kids to be thinkers. Um, you know, let scenarios play out that would encourage them to think. So many decisions are made, you know, based on mindsets and such, but I wanted them to think because we just go along with stuff without realizing it. And if people would only think, you know, like when, when for instance, you know, when I first started reading the Bible, you know, the people thinking that, um, you know that the thousand years of peace is going to come and they're and uh that everybody goes to heaven as soon as they as soon as they they die that's where you go well if you would just think common sense tells you just think why does the bible say that there's a resurrection if you're already there and so it was like an eye opener to me along the way that we just need to think you know, yes. because people aren't thinking. I mean, there it is. You know, got Christians going to church, believe, saying they believe in the Bible and believing that you go to heaven as soon as you die. And yet the very Bible they read tells you there's a resurrection. Who's being resurrected if you're already there? So we just don't think. We don't think. We need to be thinkers. We just kind of go along with it. Yep. It's very sad. We are sheep. Yeah. We need a we need our divine shepherd to help us. And thank I just thank him all the time for how he's leading us. Mm -hmm. So let's see here. So to talk a little bit about the M M I don't know if I'm pronouncing the sun goddess's name correct, but um the sun goddess that is the you know the main um point of the Shinto religion, uh, Amaterasu, according to Chronicles, uh, the first emperor of Japan, Jimu, is supposedly the direct descendant of this sun goddess, which is just like Nimrod. Um, and it should be noted that this belief was instrumental in allowing subsequent emperors to exercise absolute authority by claiming divine ancestry, which kind of reminds me all of uh, the divine right of kings, you know, that argument. Um, as one of the central kami of Shinto. Um, and this goddess is portrayed as the epitome of perfection, like Mary, right? Possessing intelligence, beauty, fertility. It's always the fertility goddess too, usually. And purity. Um, and Amaratsu's femininity was not seen as the weakness, but was instead admired and influenced the positive, almost reverent attitude towards ancient Japanese women. Given the numerous historical accounts of female Japanese rulers, as well as the many positive depictions of female deities in Shinto myths, it's likely that women in this epic had a similar status to that of men. So the next religion that came in and was brought in by an empress was Buddhism. And that's the reclining Buddha. And I thought, well, 
looks like a, uh, a man very satisfied <laughs> laying down at his side. You can see how a man would depict that statue. Um, you know what I mean? Like, okay, let the women, <laughs> let the women submit and I'll just lay here and, and recline. Um, Buddha, Buddhism has been practiced in Japan, Japan since about the sixth century. And then Buddhist schools arose and many of which trace themselves to Chinese Buddhist traditions. And according to um, the government cultural affairs as of 2018, about 84 million or 67% of the Japanese um, population are Buddhists. And then so Shinto is second to Buddhism in popularity. Buddhism was introduced in Japan as part of a diplomatic mission from Korea. I think Brother Fell's going to do Korea. Um, the religion provided a unifying ideology for the nation, and its endorsement by the imperial family meant that the spread of Buddhism helped spread acceptance of imperial authority. So they liked Buddhism, right, because it empowered them. Buddhism regressed many of the existing positive attitudes towards women because Buddha is male, so it replaced the female goddess um, that had been established by Shinto. Um, according to um, the lady who wrote Women in Ancient Japan from Matriarchal Antiquity to Acquiescent Confinement, the Buddhism that was adapted into Japanese society was immensely anti-feminine, promoting the belief that women were of an evil nature. And there's five obstacles stated that women um, in Buddhism that uh, there's five, the five obstacles and three obediences. And women were unable to attain the five spiritual states including the highest, that of a Buddha, could never be a woman. So that again, you can see that in the imperial family too. Um, the latter, a code of conduct derived from Confucian teachings asserted that women should obey their fathers when young, their husbands after marriage, and their sons when old. And Buddhism uh, is also known for its androcentric um, character exemplified by its exclusion of women from salvation. I thought that was, wow. They're excluded from salvation um, as specified in Buddha's 35th vow. I never knew that. What? Wow. Yes, but it's, yeah. The vow states that any woman determined to reach enlightenment must first receive a male body. Oh, and wow. They, they got good I know. Yeah and only then be able to enter the pure land of Amida Buddha. Wow. So this evokes a strong sense of sexism as the teaching implies that a woman's body is impure and sinful and thus hinders her ability to reach enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Or in other words, that being a woman is the worst and unhappiest state in this world. And this period of M Midism, M Midism was marked by the severe discrimination against women, many of whom were indoctrinated into actively supporting these misogynist teachings. That's why at Buddhist temple, you only see males in the Buddhist robes and worshiping. Wow, there you go. Because I've never seen women in those, you know, like documentary things. It's only m males there. Yeah learned something new i i never knew a woman couldn't receive salvation why would you even want to be a buddhist that's what i was thinking i'm like how is it so popular 84 million or whatever in japan how i guess so, so, so that I changes have. the way we see buddhism because we used to think buddhism was a passive you know kind loving to all even even animals and creatures and now we realize the women are even below that probably excellent point donna it always yep. amazes me that men can have such um, hatred or what have you, whatever word you want to put in there towards women, and yet they 
still want them for what they want them for. Like if you hate us so much, why do you do the things you do? You know what I mean? Not property. Still, we're still considered property. Yeah. You know? And why they think so the third life can go on, life can go on without women. It's like life doesn't go on when it's just men. You get rid of all the women, what do you got? Everything goes. Yeah. Yeah, they they need them and they know they need them. But uh, they've really held them, held them back, tried to hold them down and bind them in these restrictive rules. They've got them so brainwashed thinking that they're so worthless that they'll do anything for yes. them, you know. Yeah, they believe that, it. And they yeah. even got the women promoting it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just like you said. Yep. You know, like in Protestantism today. Mm -hmm. Any good country is only as good as its women. Exactly. That's why I, that's why I always heard and I, I believe that. That's a man after my heart, Francisco. You got a good one there, Sister Christine. Amen. Hang on to that man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the third religion is Confucianism. And it's one of the three um, so there's the three main religions in Japan, Shinto, Buddhism, and Confucianism. And um, there's also Taoism, but those are the three main in Japanese society. In the late 6th century, nobles read classical Confucian texts. Confucianism emphasizes the secular as well as male dominance, obedience to authority, and ethical and orderly social organization. Uh, we could even stop right there. I mean, you know what their social organization amounts to, a hierarchy with a male headship, right? Right. Chinese ideas did not change attitudes toward women immediately. In the 7th and 8th centuries, half of Japanese rulers were women. Six empresses ruled between 592 and 770. In this period, however, the Japanese absorbed Confucian and Buddhist ideas and centralized the government into a bureaucracy. To abolish matrilineal, not sure how to pronounce this, matr matrilineality and matrilocality and establish patri patrilineality, they passed the Taiho Code in the Teho Code in 702 and the Euro Code in 718, both of which discriminated against women in property, marriage, and divorce. So Chinese Buddhism was more woman-hating than the Indian form, which unlike Hinduism did not deny women's salvation. See, Hinduism um, doesn't deny salvation, but the Chinese Buddhism does. And what's interesting is it was a woman emperor who introduced Buddhism. I'm sure she didn't realize it would become such a woman-hating um, religion. Later, Buddhist sects not only denied women salvation, but taught that they suffered from original sin and five obstructions, which prevented them from reaching the five states of spiritual awareness only open to men. Can, Later, Buddhist doctrine... Wow. Uh, Check out that counterfeit with women caused original sin there. Yes. What was that? Nothing new under the sun. Wow. Later, Buddhist doctrine taught that women's only avenue to, to salvation, again, that's a repeat of what we learned earlier, lay in being reborn as a man. I found that in another um, four volume set written by a woman who. Um, has some really interesting books about it's, it's titled uh, from eve to dawn and she does all about women throughout um history uh, pretty interesting so let's see if i'm going to see if any of you recognize this quote where it comes from yes it's stephen jay gould and he wrote it came from the mismeasure of man but see if you recognize Few tragedies can be more extensive than the stunting of life. 
view injustices deeper than the denial of an opportunity to strive or even hope by a limit imposed from without, but falsely identified as lying within. I think you touched on this last week, um, Sister Elaine, and I can't say word for word how you said it, but it had to do with um, the unfortunateness of how our environment can groom us to act in ways because we believe in our own minds something that's not even true, that, that you know, we're living out this lie that we've ad adopted into our um, thinking. Yeah, and you said something. All your actions, all your actions come, it, it, to me, it made me, it, it, when I look back on it, it was like, it wasn't my own person. I, I don't know how to express it, but um, doing things based on a mindset rather than, uh, uh, not even mindset's not the right way. But yeah, acting out on the 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 situations of your life or the, the mindset that you have and still it's more like I had a free mind. Let me put it that way. My mind got freed. I, I broke that chain or the Lord broke that chain and and I to to help me to become who he purposed me to become instead of what society molded me to become. Amen. And broke, broke, broke free from that. It was like a whole new world. Amen. And, and I would say m most of us, maybe all of us have fallen prey to this, you know, you can make choices. You can make better choices in life. Um, that might've been what I was talking about last week with the choices about how you, um, your choices, you know, your, where you're at today can all be traced back to choices. And so you know, that freedom, that, that freeing up your mind to, to the mold that you were put into or the link in the chain that you are, you, you can now um, make healthy and responsible and um, wise decisions as opposed to just acting on the, yeah, how society is placed or society has placed you. Yes, and, and the Lord is trying to recreate us and make us who we were always designed to be. Right. You know what I mean? But many of us, our growth stunted, you know? We didn't fully develop because we believed we could only achieve this or that. And depending on what environment, you know, um, and you just kind of, it's a self-fulfilled prophecy you live out, you know, um, falling short, so far short of what the ideal that the Lord had in mind for you. And this, this was the, um, in the beginning of the gendered brain, I just got the book last week and I always love to read the dedications in the beginning of books. It's just something I've always done. And, um, this was right there in the beginning of that book, The Gendered Brain, um, because women, have, you know, we've, we've believed these lies. And so they've imposed limits on us and we've lived out. Many of us have lived out these lies and God is trying to break us free. Wonderful savior. So this is a parade of, uh, women who go out this right here this time in april uh, i can't pronounce it all i think it's in the next slide but they're all made to dress in this attire right with the heels they all have to wear high heels skirts and tight fitting cinched um jackets um it'll i didn't pass it today no not yet the gendered so social hierarchy in Japan has produced a number of limitations for women in business. Gender-based division of labor has been prevalent since the Meiji era, with women traditionally being assigned the household and family-related tasks. While this effective labor 
has historically been used to expand the national economy, it has mostly been unpaid. The lack of legitimacy given to this type of labor has resulted in the continued expectance of women to take up household chores, whether they have jobs or not. The current situation in Japan is that women's household duties do not diminish significantly when they are employed. As such, they cannot provide firms with the same type of flexible schedule, right, as men, and consequently tend to be excluded from core operations and management candidacy. Working women must not only navigate the cultural expectations to give up their careers to be stay-at-home mothers, but they must also deal with the widespread sexist mindsets and a general lack of challenging work. Women in lower ranking jobs are commonly referred to as office ladies or office flowers, and they're assigned menial tasks like serving tea or doing secretarial work. Additionally, some companies tend to fall into the overly female friendly trap and end up assigning high potential women as Ipan Choku to perform assistant level or low specialty jobs. This has the unintended consequence of ill-equipping women with the necessary skills needed for managerial or leadership positions. So they're not even given the opportunity. Working women must not only navigate the cultural expectations to give up their careers to be stay-at-home mothers. I read that one. Women in higher management. The organizational culture in Japanese firms is often described as a man's world. And society's understanding of a leader is based on this idea. The limited participation of women in management and leadership roles, especially in wealthy and democratic countries like Japan, has been more publicly criticized in the last few decades. Despite the high levels of education attained by its female population, Japan has very low rates of women in leadership positions. Working women, I, I keep going back to the wrong one, forgive me. So this is um, called shukatsu. And um, that first slide that I showed you where they were marching the women kind of out down the street there in all dressed in those suits with the high heels. This time of year in April, it's job seeking time when all the, um, when the, when the uh, graduates get out of school and they all have to go through this program. And it's got a rigid dress code and they don't leave you any choice in how to dress. Japan has one of the most intense, fiercely competitive and stressful recruitment processes for new graduates anywhere in the world. There's a highly structured year long recruitment process known as Shushoku Katsudo or Shukatsu for short. Applicants are expected to wear what are known as recruit suits that come in two varieties, a men's suit worn with a white shirt and dark tie, and a women's suit with a skirt, white blouse, and a jacket that's cinched in at the waist. This gender-based choice is unacceptable for some that don't feel they fit into the gender binary, and they're raising their voice to challenge the system that's dated back to the 1950s. But the whole school system there is like that because everywhere yes. in Japan, they have to wear uniforms and girls have to wear skirts. Yes. And the uniforms kind of even look naval. And some of them I looked at that have that back collar like you see in the Navy that hangs down in a square in the back on. The, I don't yeah. know if you know what I'm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shukatsu begins every April and culminates in a hiring season that lasts from August to October. Those who miss out on a job offer risk having to wait and repeat the process the next year, competing against a new fresh crop of students. It's a prospect that historically has come with a degree of shame attached to it. And there's also a backlash over, because um, Japan is banning women from wearing glasses, like it's not attractive. So um, there, like I said, there's, maybe this last movement, this last 
female movement in Japan that's raising their voice out against these sexist um, practices will be successful because um, they're speaking out uh, uh, that they can't wear glasses, right? And they're also speaking out, out about having to wear high heels. It's necessary. They must wear high heels at work. It's a rule, right? And um, the stigma can damage their chance, right? If they don't go along with these um, rigid rules, it could damage their chance of uh, d gaining a, a good position. So this little girl here, um, name is Yumi Ishikawa and she started the hashtag Kutu movement. Be and it's because she was forced to wear these high heels. And so, um, she began this movement, which gain, has gained a lot of um, popularity. And like this says here, it's made headlines around the world in 2019. And it's a play on words because shoes are called kutsu. And so she took um, from the hashtag me too and the word kutsu and it's hashtag kutu. But she worked in a funeral home and she was forced to wear high heels. Now, when I was growing up, my mom supported us, uh, three children. It was just my mom because my father committed suicide, right? And um, my mom didn't have, wasn't educated because previous to my mom, um, my father taking his life, mom was a stay-at-home mom. And so she had to go to work two jobs to raise us three kids. And her first job was for her her mother and stepdad who owned a dry cleaners. And so they put her to work in the back pressing. Back then, um, men's shirts um, were pressed. It wasn't wash and wear. They were starched and pressed under big, um, big, big pressers that had pipes. My mom would come home with burns on her ankles. She and those cuffs had to be just perfect for those men's shirts. And she'd work all day pressing shirts in that dry cleaners. And um, she got a little cocktail waitress job at night. Um, my mom was very, she got real skinny having to work that hard. And so she went out one evening and someone um, saw her and asked her if she'd like to be a waitress. They taught her to be a cocktail waitress. But um, she made so much money being a cocktail waitress that she was able to, it's kind of a sad state for society that I'm telling you, but she was able to quit that hard labor job and she could work less hours um, serving cocktails and brought home more money to help put food on the table for us three kids. Um, she did what she knew how to do. I'm not judging her, but she had to wear high heels. And um, I remember her, you know, because she had to wear a short skirt to get big tips, you know, and she had to wear revealing, um, they put them in like costumes, so similar to a Playboy bunny um, with low cut. So when the woman bend over to serve the table, you know, they'd see cleavage, they'd get bigger tips, right? And um, it's so sad, but it brought in big tips. And so uh, she would come home from work and her feet would just be killing her. She even ended up with like a uh, nervoma in the balls of her feet. I used to rub her feet. I'd sit on the couch and she'd put her feet in my lap when I was growing up and I'd rub her feet because she worked so hard and she was so tired from having to wear those high heels to earn a living. But I, I read this and it just, I just couldn't believe it that in Japan, you know, not just like a job like my mom had where you, where you have to make money on your appearance. The, in a funeral home of all things, the women have to wear, no matter what job, they have to wear high heels. It's just shameful. Yeah. And in America, there's that um, Supreme Court case with uh, that man who trans who changed to uh, being a woman and, and um, wanted to wear clothes or no, 
change being I don't remember but the funeral home was irritated because the dress code wasn't going to be worn the way they wanted to but even in America women have to wear skirts in the funeral home really I didn't know that either yeah I don't know if you talked about the same one but didn't dress female enough that was the lawyer lady okay um I think this one was that a, a male was transitioning to a female and was going to wear the female attire, but the because he the funeral director didn't consider her a female and he wanted her to wear pants. But the point was is that they have gendered, gender stereotypical um, clothing for in a funeral home. You know, it's like <sighs> no one. No, I, I go back to Ecclesiastes, none of the wealth you acquire, none of the roles you play, nothing of that you take with you in death. It's just, no. you think you'd figure it out there, but you know, it's just nowhere. It's just crazy. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. No, I appreciate the comments. You're not interrupting at all. It's very interesting and a great point that you brought because maybe all of us didn't know that. I certainly know I didn't know. So despite the country's modernization and adoption of certain liberal Western ideals, Japan continues to uphold many traditional and androcentric principles that contribute to the detriment of women's self-determination. Due to this, many women feel they must conform to a specific role in society, that of a married housewife. In order for Japan to achieve the level of gender equality it is seeking, a number of things need to take place, starting with changing cultural attitudes. Japan's patriarchal culture has shaped many aspects of women's lives. While change will not occur overnight, history has shown that ideas initially deemed foreign and threatening can become domesticated over time. In this case, Western liberal influences have already been responsible for many of the shifting attitudes towards women and their perceived role in society. I liked that when I read that because it reminded me of what we're learning and um, how we're to be uh, socially liberal and how um, these liberal influences have also brought some positive um, change. Uh, for Japan. So this comes from Ellen White. Every woman is of inestimable value in the sight of our Heavenly Father. He created woman to stand by the side of man, equal in value before God, and associated with him in the work. He, I changed this to they, were, were, given to do. The father gave his only begotten son to die for the entire human race, individually and collectively, male and female. That's it. Susan, you went above and beyond, I have to say. Oh, how do I stop? Thank you. Oh, praise God. How do I, you are screen sharing. How do I stop screen sharing? Now? At the top, there's a red stop screen share button. If you- I See it. Thank you. I never did get to see any of, I apologize to the chat folks. When it was open, I couldn't read any of the chats. I'll go back and scroll. I'm sorry if I missed any questions. Um, um, I, I have some comments and questions. Sure. Yeah. So thank you so much for this uh, enlightening uh, presentation. It was uh, delightful, very good, well done. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm I, glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I did. And um, you know, it, it sounds like you know you talked about your mother, and you know, it sounds like your mother had to do what she had to do to raise the three of you, and and in the end, you know, you did what you had to do to comfort your mother. So that was very heartwarming. So thank you for that uh, information. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for taking uh, such good care of her uh, in the end, valuing her. So um, that was beautiful. 
God, God provided that opportunity. Yeah, that was, that was, that was beautiful. Yeah, so thank you. Well, and then the question, I'll have a comment, another comment and a question. Now, it, it, it seems like this patriarchal mindset is, uh, well, maybe not totally recent, but more recent than a lot of other countries, because wasn't it uh, uh, from what, 18? 89. 89 that women were barred from yes. uh, from imperial imperial uh, throne yes so that's only 130 years ago maybe so it's that's pretty recent so my question is with all this history of women uh, occupying the, the imperial throne when that happened was there no uprising with the women no 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 um, fight? No. What, what did they do? Did they just lay down and accept it? No, it was a long sort of gradual process through that um, feudal feudalistic time period um, because many men go away and fight battles, but it wasn't that way in Japan. They The men were there. Um, but anyhow, it was during that long You'd have to kind of go in and, and search. Um, you'd pull up the book, but I stopped screen sharing. Mm, okay. there, there's a really wonderful chapter on feudalism in Japan and how that sort of took its place because the women filled positions too um, very well, right? But when the women, when the men came back, they sort of wanted their place back. And over time, they sort of relegated the women back into submissive roles. Mm. But it took it took a long time. It didn't happen overnight. Mm. You know, and then the introduction of the religious ideas that came in. Because it was the first woman emperor, I believe, was the first woman emperor that introduced Buddhism. Right. And here we come to find out that Buddhism doesn't even allow a woman's salvation. Now, how could a woman, maybe she didn't know that part. Maybe, I don't know. Like I said, a lot of this, you might have to even research deeper. But uh, it said the 35th vow, uh, the 35th vow or something like that bars women from um receiving salvation maybe that was something added an amendment to buddhism as buddhism grew i don't know but why would a woman allow uh, such a religion in that would um, do that to women i don't know yeah but so it was an introduction of religion and uh male dominance you know somehow yeah, and, and uh, earlier, you know, I, I think uh, Elaine mentioned about thinking, you know, and, and if every woman's salvation was to be a man, that means sooner or later, there's going to be no, no women, uh, where they're going to have their children. Yeah, it's, good it's, point. <laughs> I mean, do they even think about that? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, okay. they know um, they need women. Um, who was it that said that? Was it Christine that said that? Um, it was either Christine or Adriana. They know they need women, but yet they rel maybe it was Donna. Elaine. They rel huh? I think Elaine. Yeah. Was it you? Sorry, Sister Elaine. No, I think I, I think it was. Yeah, they because you know everything ends. If you get if you don't have the women, then what do you have? Everything ends. No, exactly. Exactly. And um, and then that the last boy that is born into the uh, the royal family, I mean, not that it was his choice to be born, um, just the way it happened, you know. If he didn't come along, you know, what uh, you know, those three girls, um, I would imagine one of them had to be an empress. Yes. So they've got this one boy. Yep. Because the line died out. You saw that on the one side, there was only females left. Yeah. So and, they want uh, this to continue. If it was for that boy, they had to come back. 
to the female empress. What's also really interesting that this study, um, we weren't to do gender, um, but gender, uh, Japan is very liberal. I didn't know that. I mean, you could go, you can go either way growing up. There comes a point where you have to conform. But I was reading an article. I didn't realize how um, open they were in that respect to whether you, um, uh, homosexual relationships or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's interesting culture. I, I just, I learned a lot. So are they are they liberal in are they are are they for LGBT rights and is that is there a, a movement in Japan in that way? Well, the article I read was um, about it was talking about pre modern Japan and how uh, aristocrats would male pursued male and female lovers both right and um, biological sex. Uh, were less important. Their pursuits of that seemed to be less important. Um, there was a whole movement um, of women who began to dress like in pants and stuff in the 19th century, right? And um, sodomy uh, was criminalized though um, from somewhere in the 1800s, like 1872 to 1882. Um, but since then, there's been no laws in Japan banning homosexual relations. Uh, they just kind of was different than I expected when I was reading about it, you know, but they do have like these little cosmetic, oh, I don't know how, I, I was reading an anthropologist's study and um, they like to dress up, the teenagers like to dress up and it's called like peacocking like in very colorful, inventive outfits, you know, and they had these little, you know, what is it? Hello Kitty. And they had these little fashion things that they get into. Um, some of it's genderless, completely genderless. Um, I don't know, just an androgynous outfits and um, not necessarily gay either. Some of it's genderless males and it's just it was very interesting because they're blurring like the lines and they're they've got a lot of gender bending practices i think that's but, the uh, counterculture though yeah very yes you're probably right yeah because they're the one thing that i've noticed which has been interesting um i don't know if i said this before but um when I when the communism fell on Romania in 1989 all of a sudden um western media was allowed in and you were allowed to watch shows that you know were airing in the United States and all the stuff happened but at the time that communism fell Romania was massively patriarchal women would I mean it wasn't even a question if you did something wrong you your husband would slap you to to put you in your place and you know if you cooked bad and you get a beating you know that's your fault for cooking bad kind of thing it was really it was horrible and um if you you know try to speak up against it you got ostracized because also it was a very conservative religious Christian orthodox and even Adventism there was so um once communism fell and Western media was allowed in there, you know, I'm over here, 2010, looking at videos from over there with people fighting for gay rights over there all of a sudden. So Western media, Western culture kind of seems to have influenced not just a conservative mindset in, in many places, but also more recently a liberal view because they have an opportunity to see what human rights is available what you can do you know and what you can achieve and you have access to these thoughts and philosophical ideas about human rights and, and is this okay are we doing what's right or not and I think that has a huge impact as well so pretty much I promise you every country all over the world right now is split into two groups of people a conservative side and the liberal side that's fighting against them so I think we're going to see that everywhere if we look forward. But um, 
Yeah, I think it was Brother Troy that thought the conservative side of Buddhism might have been responsible for um, bringing in the hatred of women. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very excellent point, Adriano, that you made. It does appear that way. There's two streams and everything and a split it's binary in that respect, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's really interesting. It's uh it's the issue that is turning the entire world upside down everywhere you go. Is yes. human rights. It's at the forefront for a reason. It's being it's all being brought to the forefront, you know, for this time. Yeah, and you know what I think is is massively interesting and I'm really happy that we're doing this because in the liberal side of American culture, the youth especially really fetishize other countries, um, TV shows and cultures and different things that they have. But a lot of time they're not realizing that the things that they're fetishizing are actually contributing to sexism and discrimination over in those countries. But it's not it's it's just something a form of entertainment for people here they're not realizing the effect it has over there and it's really interesting to see that a lot of what because in high school i can't tell you how many kids there were that watched like japanese tv shows and try to emulate them but those shows are just fetishizing this patriarchal system and they make women look like these emotional crazy people and men like the only logical ones that, you know, are the fighters or whatever. And I'm just sitting here, like the same people here in the liberal part of this country who are fighting for women's rights here are gonna contribute to sexism there. I don't think they're realizing it, but it's, it's so good to look at what's happening in every country because we don't know what, you know, you don't know what you might be appreciating and what it might be causing in other places. So it's nice to look outside at everything. Christine's got a good uh, post there from Micah. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Amen. It reminds me of what he's teaching us right now. Amen. So you, this was a really good presentation. It took up the whole... <laughs> the whole evening which is totally I'm fine sorry no, i just no. looked at the time and i'm like oh my gosh that time didn't seem like it took that long I <laughs> it's okay it was uh it was super informative and um i think it was a, a good starting off point because uh the reason why i had the outline the way i had is that if you want to talk about sexism and discrimination in history inevitably you always have to go back to the history of the country and the primary forms of religion and how that impacts culture um it, it is kind of more labor intensive but usually to understand sexism and discrimination and homophobia it all comes down to what are the beliefs of the nation the primary beliefs and the religious beliefs and over time how that have influenced the culture so i think you did a fantastic job of of showing that so for anyone who's having trouble figuring out how to go about it, um, looking at the religious history of those nations is a really good uh, spring off board, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it just seemed like a natural progression. I didn't, um, I didn't aim that way. I sort of, the Lord led me step by step through and that's what he showed me. And I think you're right, Adriana. You know, yeah, Ex it was excellent. Uh, I really enjoyed doing it. And so thank you for the opportunity. It's been so long since I've done anything with you guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You you did it in a really easy way to learn, too, because I have I know that they have like a feudalistic era, Meiji. So I, there's been so many eras there. And when you're not used to that history, it's really hard and easy to get confused. Um, and uh, you did a really good job. <laughs> Now I know exactly where to go, what era to go to, to figure out, you know, if I want to research this more, what happened and where. So that was very nice. 
thank you so much. And also I'm gonna put a video in the chat. It's called the history of LGBT rights every year since 1799. It's a map of the world and it just kind of shows you how it progressed through time. It's an interesting video, I thought. I'm just gonna pop that in there. Um, there you go. Anyone have anything else to say? Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Thank you. It, it was a blessing. And I, f I felt like, whoa, I, I hadn't even done, um, oh, what's it called again? What I used on, on the computer. I got a new computer last year. That was another blessing. But I had never used Keynote, right? And so it took me a little bit longer trying to find my way through. But boy, I enjoyed it. Every day I'd come home and just do a little bit more and a little bit more. It just kind of fell together. But so God is good. And you guys were wonderful participants. I just thank you. Awesome. Yeah, and yeah. You could send your notes, if you could, to me in a PDF. Can you do that? Sure, I will. Okay. We're going to keep all these notes. And um, as we do them, post them up to the website as well. You know, um, the other two countries that I chose, they don't have as much as Japan. So um, I was just noticing what Anna said that hers will be short. But you know what? Some of the countries don't have as much like as Japan did, like uh, Nepal that I have. It doesn't have as much. Um, so maybe some will be shorter than others just in that respect alone, too. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was expecting, because not every country is as developed or has had such huge changes over time but japan has been around for such a long time and they've had you know it also depends how many other countries went finagling around there so they've had you know china and korea and the united states and all kinds of wars going back and forth so it gets complicated but there's other nations who are just kind of remote and out of the way and not a lot happens there. So it's, it, it is what it is. We're just going to keep going through them. And if it's one only takes like 10 minutes, that's fine. It, everyone has a different teaching style and God doesn't expect us all to conform to one. So don't worry if your presentation is different. Uh, everybody's going to do it the way they're comfortable with they're going to use the talents that they have um, so far so don't worry about that part okay just uh present presenting your data is what's important exactly okay. and no one has to feel like they have to use keynotes or, or powerpoint or whatever if you just have an article that you found or two that we can read through and you can share a screen that's fine we're just you know trying to learn whatever it is you can get it's fine but it is, it is sad though. It is sad to see, and um, you didn't have it in there, but I know that I think the age of consent um, in Japan is like 13 or something like that for, um, for, consent, for, consent, for intimacy kind of thing. I, yeah, I didn't even hit any information on that in yeah. my readings. I did, but I'm sure you're probably right. From from just the information I because I've looked into this because of all the the people and like that I knew in high school and growing up I just keep running into folks who are really into those shows and it's getting more and more prominent here in the U S but because of those shows it causes people in Japan to view schoolgirls in such a way that's really um, uh, sexualizing. Mm -hmm. So they have a huge problem on like metro trains that take people to school and work and through the cities where men will sexually har harass or assault schoolgirls on those trains. It's a really big issue there. Um, mm -hmm. From what I remember, at least it was a few years ago. I really doubt it's gotten any better from what I hear. Um, it's just, it's really bad. And um, I don't, I don't think people realize here how, how bad it is that people here are starting to contribute in a really passive way. You know, it doesn't seem like you're doing anything bad, but it's a system there that's really, oh, and, and, and that when it comes to rape, their women just aren't believed there. You can't, there's an issue. There's also a huge issue with stalking 
with men stalking women and the police just not doing anything about it and they get the women get blamed for it like what did you do to cause him to stalk you like that kind of thing oh that's really uh, sad yeah but you could kind of see what the way the males dominate that uh, it's like a boys club they just it, right exactly Keep it all quiet yeah. that's what i've always thought of a lot of the republican party the the men they yeah. act like the the good old boys the the boys club you know in the actions that they do mm -hmm. kind of like mad gets yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, you know, even my dad, when he was alive, you know, he would say, well, you know, boys will be boys. So does that make it okay? No. And I heard that in Japan, um, the culture amongst the married men, um, that you know, after work, they, they go to their little bars and they drink and they can come home late and they can have, they can have actual extramarital affairs and the wives don't, can't really say anything. They a huge thing they do there is they still go to geisha clubs, and um, yes. it's culturally accepted that married men go yeah. to get entertained by those women. And the women and the wives don't really they can't they can't say anything about it because it's yeah. a cultural thing. Exactly, it's really sad. It is. It is very sad. I have just a comment to the study and um, appreciated it very much, uh, Susan, because um, I've been looking into, of course, the Thai culture, and it's so similar. I mean, it's Asian, and um, there's just one paragraph I want to read. I've read many articles, and there's so much information. Um, at least in Thailand, they've really produced a lot of information. But one thing about women there which I would say probably is going on in Japan. I, I don't know, you didn't mention this and uh, what the women are trying to achieve for themselves because they definitely have a low self-esteem from all that I've been reading you know, about Thai women. And it says the value of female beauty in Thailand plays an important role as a negotiator for a successful marriage and in acquiring status within a family unit, feminine beauty is considered one of the great benefits for Thai women for acquiring love and attention from their husbands and maintaining a happy life. And it goes so much far deeper than that because they even go as far as to bleach their skin. And I heard uh, one of the studies that uh, Elder Tess gave, she talked about this with women, where they bleach their skin to make it white and pure. And their sole purpose, at least from what I'm gathering, there'll be more when I get my presentation, but the sole purpose for them is to achieve some self-worth and they do this through their beauty. And that's, that's all that the husband sees in them is this beauty you know, and that's what they want to do is please that, please their husbands. And they will go as far as they have to go, whatever it takes um, to please their husband. And in other words, just bow down. And I think that was depicted very well in your slides that you showed. So um, yeah, there's a lot more to this and these women uh, probably in Japan as well, are really suffering uh, tremendously. They might not talk it so much, but they're living through it with their self-worth and to always trying to please. That, that is their, their whole desire is to just please, to just please, no matter what it takes. I agree with you. And I think it'll be really interesting. You chosen Asian culture, and I think Phil did too, which will add more pieces to this whole puzzle. I remember what you're saying. I'm trying to think of the poison that they used to drink. They used to drink it to make their skin white and it would kill them. And I have a friend, an Adventist friend. 
She's in her 70s, but she only looks like she's in her 50s. Little tiny, soft spoken. One of one of my I still visit with her. Um, she's very sweet, Japanese. And um, the first time I went somewhere with her, it was a gorgeous day out. And I'm a roll the window down, put my arm out the window kind of person, you know. <laughs> I like the fresh air. I like the sunshine. And um, she got in the car and she put on like the sunglasses, the hat, the gloves, the scarf around her neck and everything. And I was like, wow, Naomi, you're all, (laughs) you know, you're all bundled up. And it was because she didn't want any sun on her. Yeah. And and she's been doing that for years. It also um, to keep keeps wrinkles perfectly white and pale yes it has to do with wrinkles but also in japan that very um porcelain kind of skin that yeah that is um, exaggerated in the geisha right with the white makeup and all that that is like a symbol of beauty right the way they bind their feet back in the day to the way they couldn't walk but a lot of that was done for control so that they couldn't run away and leave the, the husband where the feet were bound. Yeah, there's a lot of avenues that you could go down. There's a lot of information. And uh, some like Japan had so much that I had to like kind of broad brush across. Yeah, it's yeah. there's a lot. To Boy, it. what a strive. Point you brought up, Jackie. Thank you. Yeah, it's they're just striving to be accepted. And it says that um, beauty has been almost has taken almost a form of religion in the pursuit of an ideal body for women. Wow. That, that is really sad. It measures her whole being and therefore attaining the perfect feminine body undeniably gives the female pleasure of being feminine. Therefore, beauty serves as a form of societal and inner personal acceptance and it is something that you have such little control over it is so sad thank you jackie oh you're welcome um yeah i'm looking forward to learning even more as everyone else presents. You know, we take this in together and and we know where we are now, you know, how what it's teaching us about our world. I've been in a closet for so long. I haven't seen anything. Just kind of like blinders on. Just, uh, yeah, I, I think with the George Floyd thing, sure with racism and, and, um, and shoving, the black race down and, you know, that, but didn't see the full picture there either. And now God is opening up the world to us. Well, physical chains are, are easy to see, but mental chains are hard, especially when you grow up with them thinking that it's not chains that you actually have, but yes. it is. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it's normal. When you look at it that way, you just loathe it, you know? Mm -hmm. this might make it possible as we learn how to help other people when we go to help them and reach them we'll be more educated in maybe what we're going up against in their mindset do you know what i'm saying yeah because we have if you're especially in the u.s there's a diverse group of people here and a lot of have you have you seen how many people here in the united states now are gravitating towards korean skincare routines they're like these 10 yeah. step things to maintain as much beauty as possible. And it's, it's all the cultures are starting to mingle and there's things coming over here. And so I think it's going to help a lot to know what everything is happening everywhere and to know how to deal with it. Yeah. I know yeah. that, I know that skincare in general is really big in all the Asian cultures. The big, big money on, on just skincare product. I think Korea leads, leads, leads leads all of them but they it's a huge industry so beauty is a huge industry in these cultures 
Anna just posted that Avon was brought out by a Korean company. I didn't know that. Yes, I'm an Avon representative and most everything in the brochure is uh, Korean, Korean beauty. And it's, it's really very good, you know, because they have beautiful skin. So when it comes to beauty products, they, they do know what they're talking about, you know, but it's, very, it's also very pricey. So the prices of Avon has gone way up because of this buyout. Yeah, it seems everything is kind of reaching astronomical levels of affordability. Yes. You know, uh, I know, ugh, right now. <laughs> so, too. But Avon still does have uh, a lot of their um, original products. It's just the, the Korean influence and the addition to the Korean products. Those are the ones that are pricey, is the Korean. Yes, even Avon. Nope, I didn't know that. Thank you. So now when we go back to what Elder Tess said, that there is no equality even within the left because you can't have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez looking like Michael Moore and still listen to her message. And it's true. That is very true. Yes. Yeah. Very true. We're willing to respect Michael Moore and his ideas, but if she looked like that, no one would respect what she had to say. Yeah, something to think about there. So Brother Troy, he had a question here. I don't know if that was answered or not, Troy. There was a point you said that you, you weren't sure of. It says, it says, sorry, Jackie, could you, could you repeat your last point if possible? Yeah, I'm trying to think what. Well, we were talking about the beauty and how important it is for the Asian women, the Asian women in Thailand, especially, but other Asian countries as well. And uh, how much they live for that, for their beauty. And, it, and it's a lot of it, as this article says, it's, it's to please their husbands. And that's very important to them. It plays a very important role, it says, as a nego negotiator for a successful marriage and an acquiring status within a family unit. I don't know if that was the point um, that uh, was made. One of the points I made is I was just read a few things out of this article. He said that. Yeah. that. Yes, he said thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. But a lot of what it is is the society um, making women value themselves only for the traits that they're useful for to patriarchy. So um, youth and uh, reproductivity. You want to make pretty babies and you want to be nice and fertile and pleasing to men's eyes. So it's a really in, intense way to objectify women and to make their self-worth be completely tied to those things that only men like. But men don't want to be talked back to. They don't want an independent mind. They don't want anyone smarter than them. So all those characteristics have to be downplayed and kind of illegalized. And that's what it is that's happening pretty much everywhere. I think the United States had a big part for, of um, of of uh, objectifying women. Um, I think the the power of Hollywood has uh, far-reaching power throughout the world because um, if you see a lot of like Japan and and you, you see something come out in Hollywood, you know, a hairstyle or something like that. And next thing you know, you, you got 15,000 uh, women uh, uh, dyeing their hair this color or, or, or having it cut this way or that way. Or, or if you see men wearing a certain kind of uh, clothing or hairstyle and next thing you know, you got, uh, 
millions of copycats trying to trying to em emulate that. And I think uh, us as a culture here in, in the States, we have big influences throughout the world, you know? Yeah, especially in fashion. And yeah. what's really sad is the burden that puts on people who can't afford any of it, because as we know, it changes every season, yeah, every year. So, or something, I don't know, fall, I don't know, there's seasons, I don't know how it works. Maybe it's multiple times a year, I don't know. But, you know, no one can afford to keep buying so much stuff, especially in today's economy. So you're just, you have this insane burden to portray something that's just only useful in this in a patriarchal system so it's just it's such a it's such a form of of bondage and it, you don't realize it because you're born into it and it's normal so if you think of it as mental bondage or like mental chains because that's what it is and it's it's harder to grapple with than if you were like you know if someone is manipulating you it's harder to deal with that than if someone is just punching you in the face because you can go to the cops and say this person is punching me in the face this is assault it's abuse but to say this person made me feel really bad and i have i don't feel like i'm worth anything anymore no one's no one cares about that for some reason so it's it's so much harder but so so prevalent and so damaging we're backwards you can't even go to the cops after you've been uh, physically abused and then um mom and dad-in-law go and bail him out because it's it was my fault that he did that so it's even it even goes even deeper even worse because you know i couldn't even put my husband in jail for more than two days and my my mom and dad in law would bail him out and then say and tell me well if he would have just kept your mouth shut he wouldn't have hit you so it's your fault not his so anyway it, it just goes you know deeper than what you just explained oh wow so sad. Yeah. No I personal I, I responsibility. My mother-in-law this because when she when she um, became free of her husband after he passed, it was like that that cage just opened and she just you know was acted like a totally different person. But while he was still alive, all he had to do is put his finger up to his mouth, you know, to tell you know to tell her to shut up. And in mid sentence, she'd stop talking. So she was raised like that. It was it was pretty sad. Well, that's, that's that's pretty sad. Sure. Men has to put hands on a woman. I mean, it just says so much about his character. If, if you ask me, you know. And a product of his environment too. Right. That if his role model was like that, then he that's you know what he thinks is the right thing to do. Amen. Well, for next week. Um We have, so that was Susan. I'm gonna put an X there if that's okay. Mine's only 10 minutes long. Okay. Just FYI. Okay, that's fine. Elaine, how do you think yours might be? Maybe 20 to 30. Okay. Mine might be about 10 minutes as well. Mine too. Um, okay. Um, it's like 30. So that's okay. Does anyone else want to go on the, on the list for next week that um, I want to vote? Oh, just one thought, excuse me. Um, yeah, I had Brazil, but I got into Thai, Thailand, and I I never got to Brazil. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't have to do all the ones you signed up for. Just one of them yeah, that you have time. That'll for. be later. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Um, okay.
Okay. If not, I might take some time to look into uh, one of the ones that I was doing. So I think I did uh, France and Italy, but we shall see. Uh, as far as this though, did anyone find any other countries that they wanted to sign up for? We still have in the top list here, which is really crazy because I didn't realize how many countries had a higher population. And there's some really tiny countries that have a really high population that I did not realize. Um, did someone put something in the chat? Donna wrote that it was a blessed Sabbath today. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so we'll just uh, leave this off then. And as we keep going, why can't I find the right one? There we go. As, as we go on and we need more, we'll, we'll populate that list more. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and pray and close us off it's okay, if it's all right. Yeah, and then, and then can we go to the schedule just so we could talk about Wednesday? Yeah. After, after the prayer. All right, so everyone stick around after the prayer for some schedule discussion. Just quick. <laughs> yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, it's been such an incredible Sabbath day with such incredible messages that we've been able to participate in and listen to. Are they've expanded our minds and uh, opened our eyes and our ears to see and hear truths that we weren't aware of before, Lord. And we thank you so much. We thank you so much for how you continue to lead us and guide us into, into um, acceptance and love and compassion for others and you continue to change our hearts and our minds so that we can exemplify the character that we need for heaven and the character of our most glorious example our lord jesus christ lord we've had so long that we we didn't understand you but now we're really starting to see and understand who you are and uh, what you care about the most and it is so beautiful and even a great relief to be on this side of, of events and, and beliefs because it's, it's so much easier to be kind than to work yourself up to be mean. And, and we thank you, Lord, so much for this incredible joy that we get to experience now and the incredible equality and freedoms that you've opened our eyes to and, and you've unshackled us from those mental chains of bondage that we were in. We, we might still have some in there. If there are, Lord, please help us to tear through those as well and to go free into the future and to give all this beautiful message to all the world. We thank you so much for um, how you've kept us together for so long and how you've made us all willing to want to keep searching deeper and digging deeper and to study more and see the depths of all these issues. And we ask that you continue to help us be willing and open to do that so that we can always pass whatever test comes up. We thank you for everyone who was able to be here. Um, there were some things spoken about today that might challenge some individuals as we know that there's been struggle in the movement worldwide. And we ask that you please, please be with those people who are struggling. Help them to see and guide their minds and their hearts. Be with them and help them to see the glorious um, blessing that can come from, from accepting these truths and, and how much better it can make every single person's life. Um, if we could just go forward into this beautiful system that you have prepared for us. We thank you so much for always watching out for your people and guiding us and help us to continue to be more and more humble as time goes on and help us to understand um, how, how we had it wrong for quite a bit of time. And, and like Elder Parminder said today, we might have thought that we were more than we were just based off the Bible structures, but I thank you so much, Lord, for the humility and the um, things that you're showing us, because it's, it's so much more beautiful for all of us to be together and united as one people and, and to not be fighting over things like that. And we thank you so much for bringing more love into our hearts in that way. 
I thank you so much. And we pray all of these things in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you.